Welcome to the American Society of Echocardiography COVID-19 webinar series. Today we will present the American Society of Echocardiography statement on point of care ultrasound during the 2019 novel coronavirus pandemic. My name is Dr. Amar Jori. I'm a cardiologist at Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario. And it is my great pleasure to present my three guest panelists, Dr. Benjamin Galen from the Montefiore Medical Center, Bronx, New York, Dr. Sharon Mulvey from Dalhousie University, Halifax, and Dr. Ritu Taman from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Pittsburgh. Welcome everybody. Why do we conduct point of care ultrasound in patients with COVID-19 infection? Simply put, in infection with severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2 in particular, POCUS may help triage the dyspneic patient and determine the need for subsequent imaging. In our statement, we talk about three types of point of care ultrasound, including cardiac POCUS, lung POCUS, and a little bit about vascular POCUS. Cardiac POCUS in this context is very useful for the detection or characterization of pre-existing cardiovascular disease that may be manifest in ill patients. Cardiac POCUS is also very useful for the early identification of worsening cardiac function, monitoring and examination of our patients. Cardiac POCUS has also been found to be very useful in the elucidation of cardiovascular abnormalities that are potentially associated with this significant infection. There are now reports of patients with COVID-19 suffering from pericardial effusion and or myocarditis that can progress to shock. There are also reports suggesting the incidence of DVT and pulmonary embolism, and of course, LV systolic dysfunction. In our statement, we also delve into the value of lung point of care ultrasound, especially when radiographic studies such as CT might be limited, lung focus can be used to trend the severity of COVID-19 infection as an adjunct to eximetry and the physical examination. Finally, we also delve into a little bit about vascular point of care ultrasound. Assessment of the IVC or JVP plays an important role in the hemodynamic assessment of any critically ill patient. DVT risk increases with any critically ill bed bound patient so it can also be assessed in some cases with vascular point of care ultrasound. At the American Society of Echocardiography homepage, the ASC University homepage, we have developed resources that define the cardiopulmonary point of care ultrasound protocol. We have modified this protocol slightly for patients that have suspected or confirmed COVID-19 infection. We now delineate a detailed protocol that looks at several views related to cardiac POCUS, pulmonary POCUS, and vascular POCUS. Specifically, we describe a protocol, protocol focusing on the parasternal long axis, the parasternal short axis, apical views, the IVC, and chest views of the lung. This allows us to look for A-lines, pleural effusion, lung V-lines, and lung consolidation. Dr. Galen will be going into the details of the lung ultrasound later in this webinar. One of the figures that we developed in this statement nicely summarizes aspects of this POCUS protocol, as well as the structure imaged, the assessment approach, and the disease associations. This table here was developed thanks to Dr. Sharon Mulvey, who I'm going to ask to go over some of the specific details for our listeners today. 
Dr. Melvey, would you mind talking to us about this detail, this table here? Thank you, Dr. Jory, and it's a pleasure to have participated in uh, this uh, uh, activity uh, by the um, ASC. Um, I would uh, like to state that this table is really there for a very quick reference uh, when you are planning your um, assessment of the patient if you are utilizing point-of-care ultrasound. And as you can see in the uh, top uh, section is the cardiac assessment um, achieved through the views that uh, Dr. Jory has just mentioned uh, quickly. Uh, the point is to be able to do a quick assessment of uh, a goal-directed exam. And uh, parasternal views, long axis and short axis, uh, can yield an enormous amount of information um, about the left ventricular size and function. Uh, certainly we are looking for any global or uh, regional abnormalities given that COVID-19 has been associated with the development of cardiac abnormalities in more than a quarter of patients. Um, stress cardiomyopathy is another um, possibility that could exist as well as an acute coronary syndrome due to uh, coronary artery disease and aggravation of inflammatory state. Uh, the right ventricular assessment is also very important because um, of the hypercoagulable state that has been recognized in COVID-19 uh, patients. And uh, this can uh, predispose to the development of a thromboembolic disease and assessment of right ventricular strain, uh, enlargement of the right ventricle, decreased function can certainly trigger one's thinking about a pulmonary embolism. Um, Similarly, um, if there is a shock state that the patient is uh, in or has developed, um, we always must be able to quickly uh, exclude the possibility of cardiac tamponade. In general, um, no specific valvulopathy has yet been associated uh, with COVID-19 to our awareness, but certainly patients that have pre-existing uh, valvular disease can develop uh, cardiac uh, complications, hemodynamic stresses that could uh, aggravate underlying valvular heart disease, which can be assessed as well. As mentioned, um, the point of point-of-care ultrasound it, in the assessment of a COVID patient is that we are not doing just cardiac evaluation, but it is multi-system, includes cardio, pulmonary, and vascular. And the lung um, ultrasound is very important. I think as cardiologists, um, many of us just used to think that lungs got in the way, but there's enormous amount of information in the artifacts that are uh, produced uh, in lung ultrasound. And we're gonna hear more about that in detail from Dr. Galen. Uh, what we're particularly looking for is evidence of interstitial edema as uh, is seen in the presence of B lines, which are abnormal versus A lines, which are normal artifacts. And you'll hear more about that. Also, there have been observations in the uh, plural um, features that we can see with lung ultrasound that are more associated with COVID-19. And subpleural consolidations and thickening um, is seen with viral pneumonias in general, but also, of course, with uh, COVID pneumonia. And if this progresses, then lung uh, consolidation uh, with typical air bronchograms can be seen, although that is more in a bacterial type rather than a viral pneumonia. And effusions, if there are large uh, pleural effusions, one might think more of a congestive heart failure as opposed to a primary COVID-19 being the etiology as there seem to be smaller effusions present. And also, as Dr. Jory mentioned, uh, particularly in the patient, if you're suspecting a pulmonary embolic disease, um, assessment of the uh, vascular structures that we're not really familiar with as cardiologists, but certainly looking at the uh, leg veins and being able to assess for DVT. But something we're more familiar with and from the subcostal view is to be able to make an assessment of the JVP and uh, understand what the fluid status is of the patient that is before us. So um, all of these uh, features are very, very helpful uh, in uh, being able to extend our um, understanding from uh, a very limited examinations that we can now do uh, in, in dressed in full PPE in the evaluation of COVID-19 patients. So there is um, a thought to uh, uh, utilizing COVID um, in COVID patients, POCUS as the first line application of uh, ultrasound, if indeed uh, we do feel that an assessment of uh, the cardiopulmonary status is necessary. Now, POCUS isn't going to be necessary in all suspected uh, COVID or uh, confirmed COVID patients, but certainly if there's clinical indication, it is a readily available tool that can help understand uh, further the pathophysiologic condition of the patient in front of you. 
Um, certainly, it cuts down on uh, uh, PPE use, uh, personal protective equipment, because it can be done by the operator that's already in there evaluating the patient if they are skilled in point of care ultrasound. Of course, if they are less skilled, uh, then we could perhaps get the wrong information or misinformation or missed findings, which is a definite uh, concern in the use of point of care ultrasound in general. And that is why it is, ex is extremely important to have the appropriate training and for the operator to work within their skill set. Of course, there are some newer developments with teleguidance and utilization of artificial intelligence on some of the uh, handheld systems that can uh, enhance uh, the interpretations uh, by the uh, operator at the bedside. Next slide. Thank you, Dr. Mulvey. Uh, that really summarizes the uh, value of point of care ultrasound uh, in the uh, first line application of these patients that we're uh, assessing. One of the things that we try to develop uh, during this, uh, sem this statement was an examination of how point of care ultrasound may integrate with echocardiography. And Dr. Taman uh, helped us construct this figure. Dr. Taman, could you speak to this figure for us, please? Thank you so much. This figure summarizes in a very succinct way what Dr. Mulvey has just gone over, with the emphasis being uh, safety and uh, preservation of PPE, which is a very valuable resource and a limited resource. So we are trying to both diminish the time of exposure and also how many people are exposed. So in the first box, we're starting out with just either suspicion of somebody with COVID or someone who's confirmed COVID. These are generally patients who are coming to the hospital in some kind of distress. Um, and we evaluate them in the usual way. And laboratory data that we will focus on is troponins, which are elevated in up to uh, four, 25% of patients presenting. Now, if it's just a minor uh, elevation in troponin, that means something different than some, and it could be just a marker of uh, the immune response or cytokine storm. So we then go on to proceed with uh, a POCUS, which will then let us know if there is um, an underlying cardiac issue. Again, there are also clinical suspicions. Someone's having chest pain, someone's having an arrhythmia, their EKG changes, all of those would make us lean towards going to POCUS first. And then if the, with the use of POCUS, it is really to answer the clinical question. So the focus being, can we answer in this, uh, using this one modality? If we're able to answer the clinical question, we can stop there. If we cannot answer the question, then the con we can either convert into a limited um, transthoracic, depending on what sort of instrument you've brought in, whether you've got a handheld or you've got a totally functional um, echo machine and you're using that to just do POCUS. And that would then um, proceed and hopefully you get your answer. Um, as we know, POCUS does not have, we have color Doppler, but we do not have pulsed wave or continuous wave Doppler. So sometimes we need to, to get more information. That's, a, that's it for this summary. We wanted to keep it very streamlined and very um, succinct. So it's ex extremely important uh, to recognize that um, when uh, a POCUS examination is performed, uh, that it also be um, archived. Um, and that it be saved. Uh, particularly in our COVID patients, uh, sometimes um, uh, we can use a uh, point of care ultrasound as an extension of the physical examination and just record the results in the um, uh, uh, notation on the patient's documentation. But it is highly recommended uh, for COVID patients in particular because we can use this as a tool to follow in their uh, condition if they should subsequently deteriorate. And if you do not have archive material, you cannot compare uh, the study uh, from before. So um, it's uh, very, very important to archive uh, the uh, study and, and uh, so that it can be referenced subsequently.
That's a great point, Dr. Melvey. I appreciate that. And that uh, speaks to how um, it can be integrated with the echo lab because if a initial point of care ultrasound is conducted and then an echocardiogram is conducted afterwards, we can go back to that uh, image if it's archived and make some comparisons and also guide our subsequent uh, echo image as Dr. Taman mentioned and also reduce the time of scanning uh, as well. So um, before we move on, uh, we also brought, about, brought up the point of safety and cleaning in this document. And I'm gonna get Dr. Gallen to speak to the highlights of this table that we've constructed and included in the statement. Hi everyone, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. So I think the uh, table that was developed is uh, very concise and I would refer you to the statement um, for step-by-step -step instructions on uh, how to uh, develop a protocol for cleaning your ultrasound or echo machine during the COVID um, pandemic. But I think a few key points I would um, want to uh, highlight are that um, uh, it's, it's really necessary to uh, make sure that everyone involved in, in using your machine knows the protocol and, and that might be a local um, video clip just demonstrating the proper cleaning uh, of the machine. That, that might be a posted flyer, uh, that might be an email flyer or, or all of the above. Um, but it's really important that everyone um, take extra time to, to ensure that there's to, to reduce nosocomial spread um, here. And I think that's very important. Um, you know, I'm, I'm coming from New York, where at one point everyone had COVID in the hospital. But early on, you know, there were, uh, as it started to come in, many patients who did not, and especially um, for the providers using the machine as well, um, reducing the, the ultrasound machine um, and its potential to be a, a fomite uh, was very important. So um, I think a few uh, pearls, you know, the, the uh, wet time on a, uh, an antiseptic was something I was not familiar with. Uh, I think the uh, echo labs are much more um, uh, established in terms of cleaning protocols, but some of the point of care uh, clinician realm, this was uh, something I had to look into, but uh, certain uh, antiseptics are approved for probes and uh, certain uh, products are approved for machines. I think top, making sure your manufacturer um, has approved the, the particular product for use on the probe uh, is key. And also, um, making sure that you abide by the wet time. So it, it's uh, uh, specified really, I think, through testing on um, the cert certain uh, equipment that, that it has to stay wet for a certain amount of time to be effective at killing um, viruses and other microbes. So uh, I think that's important. The other uh, highlight I would say is there's some, there's some clever um, elements to, to using uh, the antiseptic in, in, in the right way as you're entering a room, bringing in a, um, an extra uh, swab as, uh, of antiseptic as you enter the room so that you can use it while you're still in your PPE, and then um, pushing the machine out of the room um, if it's on wheels um, or if it's, if it's a handheld, doing an additional decontamination step outside the room you know, repeating that um, as well. I also really encourage everyone with a, with a machine on a stand uh, or a cart to really remove uh, as much excess equipment um, from the machine. Um, just during this time, it, the extra stuff tends to get stuck into the bins and the drawers, and that's really unnecessary. Uh, and, and the last highlight I wanted to mention um, was that the uh, um, the uh, uh, sorry, I I, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. I think. Um, Oh, uh, with a, uh, um, uh, actually, I, I can't remember, but I, I would refer you back to the document. Um, if it to me, I'll, I'll mention Great. It. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gellin. Those are some really um, good points. Uh, the other thing we uh, mentioned in this document, as Dr. Mulvey has already talked about, was the archiving and storage issue. Um, so we'll move on to uh, who should be performing point of care ultrasound. Um, we mentioned that there is a document available now, the ASC recommendations for echo labs participating in point of care ultrasound and critical care echocardiography that provides some guidance. However, uh, there are other credentialing systems and societies uh, available as well. And uh, we recognize that uh, in a pandemic, there may be a tiered response where 
uh, non-intensivists may also be directly managed in patients with COVID-19. Uh, and so as Dr. Mulvey mentioned, we may look at creative ways of making sure people get training and also some uh, remote uh, guidance. Dr. Melvey, would you like to finish off this section by telling us about some of the training resources that are available? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Jory. Um, and, and I'd like to mention too that, as you said, there are some novel ways that we can be getting hands-on experience right now, such as with simulators, et cetera, for the learners. Uh, but we should not be learning on COVID patients. And that's, I think, a very important point is that we should have our most experienced personnel doing the studies on the COVID patients because that will reduce the amount of time, reduce the amount of exposure, reduce the need for additional testing uh, with additional use of scarce PPE. So um, POCUS uh, training is not to be done on COVID patients. <laughs> it's, it's not the time to do it. But as you said, you know, if uh, the situation becomes that uh, there are um, overwhelming, and fortunately, it seems that we are getting more to a, uh, a, a um, flattening of the curve in, in most uh, locations. But if the situation had become to an overwhelming uh, um, uh, uh, episode of uh, lack of uh, adequately trained individuals, then perhaps um, we could have relied, we can rely on the teleguidance and artificial uh, intelligence devices that are available. So um, I think this is a good learning for the value of point of care ultrasound. And for those of you that are still uh, in the learning curves, these are excellent resources, depending on where you are uh, for the completely novice user, user and um, uh, medical student. Um, Dr. Jory led a wonderful task force as part of the ASC that put together an extraordinary set of six modules that will go from, you know, A to Z or Z, now I'm back in Canada, to be able to uh, incorporate um, and develop, uh, incorporate the knowledge that you need to be able to develop your skills to do an appropriate cardiopulmonary and vascular uh, point of care ultrasound uh, as a foundation to do that. As well, lung ultrasound is something that has, uh, as we've mentioned, is very valuable. We're going to get on and Dr. Galen's going to talk, teach us in a crash course right away here, particularly for the COVID patient. But um, there, this is another excellent resource that has been developed at Queen's University um, with respect to lung POCUS. I would also refer you to some of the uh, Twitter journal clubs and uh, Dr. Uh, Tomlin is going to talk more about that because there's some real great nuggets of information in there as well. So um, Dr. Galen, uh, I think this is an appropriate time for you to get us up to speed as cardiologists on lung ultrasound in the COVID patient. Thank you so much. If I could, I'm just going to request the remote control here. And I actually, I remembered what I had meant to say um, with uh, regards to, to the cleaning. Two weak spots are the gel container. Very often, uh, you know, you're touching that with a, a, a contaminated hand. Uh, Got to remember to clean that off uh, your gel as well as uh, the wipes container itself. If you bring a, a container of wipes into the room and then access it, that's something that has to be then later cleaned outside the room. So um, gel containers, are you using the disposable gels then, the little gel packs? Or a novel idea is to put it in a syringe, I put just the gel you need. And, and sorry to interrupt there, but I think yeah, that's an, maybe that's bring that out idea. later. Great idea. The other option is to, uh, to just have a, uh, an aliquot on your glove um, as you enter, depending on how much gel you need. Uh, if you're using a handheld, some, some people use a uh, emesis basin with the handheld, a wipe and the gel in it as they enter and then dispose of it in the room. Um, to start the remote. Uh, I'm just trying to control the slides here. If um, there, I think I have it. So uh, I want to start out by, uh, I know this is a topic. Some of you are, are using long ultrasound every day. Some have, have really not um, ever seen some of this stuff and I appreciate the chance to kind of uh, go over it uh, from, from the beginning. So um, lung ultrasound is uh, I think very um, interesting from a, a radiology standpoint because uh, normal lung doesn't image, you know, there's nothing to see. So uh, we can see certain pathologies and we also rely on artifact, uh, which is an, an interesting uh, distinction from radiology um, in that we are using artifact diagnostically. Um, the other thing that um, I wanted to mention, particularly for COVID uh, imaging, is that the uh, patterns that we're very used to using in the pre-COVID assessment, uh, I think, based on probabilities, now become a little more challenging. And, and the example of that um, is, is the beeline pattern that, that you guys already mentioned, you know, that uh, a bilateral uh, beeline pattern uh, is more than three 
artifacts, uh, actual view lines uh, in, in rib space in the, in the areas that are uh, looked at with ultrasound, that that actually is very uh, highly suggestive of carbon. Uh, it looks like I can't actually control the slide. So if someone's able to, um, to take it back, I can just say next slide. Um, let me see here. Well, um, the uh, uh, diagram here on the right is, is a little complicated. There's a reference for it. I want you to um, do that on your own. But uh, what you're seeing on the left moving is um, uh, the comet tail artifact. And what, what differentiates it from, say, a ring down artifact is that these uh, diffuse uh, confluent B lines are originating at the pleural surface. Um, you see two rib shadows. Those are the anechoic or black um, areas where, where nothing is imaged. And be between them is a, uh, uh, the B line uh, pattern in a single rib space. So many, so many B lines that they're confluent. And, and they obliterate any A lines. Um, I'll show an example later. A line is normal uh, lung, and that is um, obliterated by B lines, and the, the B lines have to extend out to, to the entire end of the screen. Um, what if you click next? There's uh, highlighting on this table that uh, ARDS and cardiogenic pulmonary edema both um, have interlobular septi thickening, um, which result in this artifact. And so uh, the challenge, I think, in assessing a patient with COVID is that that uh, if you were worried about new onset heart failure or cardiogenic pulmonary edema from say myocarditis or LV dysfunction, uh, you might have uh, difficulty differentiating that from ARDS. Whereas historically, uh, we really only saw people presenting with uh, bilateral beeline pattern. It was cardiogenic edema. ARDS was much less common. So that's something to consider. The other thing about uh, COVID pneumonia is it is, it is a bilateral pneumonia and you can see uh, beelines in pneumonia. And so we'll get into the progression of disease for, for COVID pneumonia, but bilateral beeline pattern can be seen in patients with COVID just from pneumonia as well. So I think we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, an illustration of uh, what has been observed by several uh, members of the POCUS community that, that there is a progressive lung finding. And, and uh, there's a cartoon here at the top left of what an A-line looks like. And that's a reverberation artifact of the pleural surface. That's normal aerated lung. And uh, if you uh, end up with the uh, COVID pneumonia progressing, the, the B lines may become more significant. Uh, and then additional findings are thickening of the pleura with subpleural consolidation. Again, that was seen in um, other diseases, pneumonia, uh, PE with pulmonary infarct. It's not specific to COVID pneumonia, but then consolidated lung representing the, the loss of aeration um, would be a failure, you know, it's more typical of, of a lobar pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia. We can go to the next slide. So uh, this is just uh, sample clips. The, the A-line pattern, you see the A-lines themselves are the uh, horizontal lines, the reverberation artifact. Um, that's the same distance from the probe to the pleural line, um, as you see in the top left. Uh, the example in the middle is a, um, a so, sort of a discrete B-line pattern where you see the actual B-lines. Um, and then uh, as they progress, they can, they can become confluent. You'll all notice that this is a uh, phased array probe in the abdominal setting. Uh, there are a lot of different options for imaging the lung. That includes high frequency superficial um, imaging of the pleura using the, the linear uh, or vascular probe uh, that, that doesn't have the depth but has a, a very high resolution at the superficial structures of the pleura. Uh, you can see uh, clearly uh, lung sliding, which I didn't get to mention earlier, but uh, that rules out pneumothorax and I'll mention that a little later. You can see that with the, the uh, high frequency, I'm sorry, with, with the, the high resolution, high frequency probe, but the lower frequency probes like the face array probe can also image that. Uh, as far as where to image, we use a, um, uh, we mentioned an eight to 12 zone uh, pro uh, pro approach in our uh, statement. Uh, you could listen to as many sites as you want. It's kind of like auscultation. Uh, listen to as many uh, spots as you can. You might find something more, but sufficient, um, you know, for the, uh, supine patient is, is an eight zone, eight lung zone approach, which is two um, in the anterior mid, mid clavicular line um, on either side uh, and two in the uh, mid axillary line. I think that with prone patients in COVID pneumonia and with a lot, a lot of the posterior lung fields being um, observed to be important um, by other imaging, uh, it's reasonable to look at posterior fields as well. So um, I just wanna show you an example of, uh, on the left, we have a normal A-line pattern Again, this is uh, the uh, phased array probe in the abdominal setting. 
but you can appreciate on the right that there's a subplural consolidation and, and this is uh, also accompanied by uh, abnormal, abnormal plural imaging, which uh, looks very shredded as opposed to that nice, smooth, normal plural line on the left. And, and that's a that sign um, which can be suggested in other settings. Uh, here we have low bar consolidation. We have consolidated a Dr. Galen, can you check your microphone a little bit so that we can hear you a little bit better? Uh, sure. Can you hear me uh, now? Sorry. Yes. It's Okay, thanks. Um, so the uh, image here, uh, both of these are examples of how lung, when it's uh, consolidated, uh, becomes the density of solid organ. And it's uh, the same density as the liver or the spleen um, or the kidney. And, and uh, that density is interrupted by hyperechoic um, bronchograms. So the, the white areas in the lung are actually air bronchograms. They can be static or they can be... Um, uh, dynamic, which uh, is a little bit of an advanced di distinction. Uh, we also see pleural effusion, which is that uh, anechoic uh, fluid surrounding the lung. That's um, very simple here. Uh, you can de detect whether it's simple or complex pretty easily with point of care ultrasound. So uh, the next slide. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the different probes that could be used. On the left, you see the uh, high frequency linear probe. Um, it has a, uh, a line across as opposed to the single point origin of the phase array probe. Um, but this uh, you, you, you uh, might use to clarify uh, lung sliding, um, or if you didn't see it with the, the phase array probe, you'd want to look with this probe before considering it to be pathologic. And the, and the reason is this just you see that uh, plural line uh, very clearly, and you can see it sliding. So uh, another option you'll appreciate as echo folks, uh, you know, the uh, use of M mode um, across the, the uh, lung image is really helpful because um, it adds additional um, pattern recognition um, movement of the pleural line, uh, again, which, which rules out pneumothorax, it's normal. And that generates what's, what on the left is a, is a seashore pattern. You have that sandy beach um, in, and then a, a ocean um, uh, behind it. And that's a seashore pattern. To the right, there's a stratosphere sign or, or sorry, if you could go back. Uh, one slide, uh, the stratosphere sign or barcode appearance of a, um, an M mode is suggestive of the, the static um, pleural line. That static pleural line is, is highly suggestive of pneumothorax, especially if it, um, you know, was, uh, if there was no other explanation for it. Uh, one other finding you might see is something called lung point where a single rib space has both a moving segment of pleura and, and a, a halted area that's not moving at all. And that's actually 100% specific. So you see on the left here, there's a uh, pleura that's sliding. And on the right, in the same rib space is uh, akinetic, no moving pleura. And that, that's suggestive of pneumo at that, at that space. Uh, one other um, thing, again, that, uh, this is packing a lot of stuff. Pulse is, you can practice this on yourself. If you hold your breath, uh, look at your left interior uh, lung, you'll actually see in M mode, uh, your heartbeat uh, transmitted into the lung. And that, that actually uh, makes it for us. Dr. Galen, can you check your microphone again for us, please? Thank you. Sorry, I, uh, maybe it's a bad connection. I'm doing, doing the best I can. It looks like um, I, uh, it's still working um, here. I hope you guys can hear me. Yes. So uh, on, the, uh, on the right, you can actually see if uh, the, the pulse is not, it's not sliding. It's actually actually the heart be transmitted. And again, just to be very clear, uh, normal lung sliding is seen um, uh, that, that rules out pneumothorax. If you have pleura that's not moving, uh, it's best uh, thorax, but that can also be right main stem intubation. That can be fibrotic, um, you know, lung that it doesn't, uh, it's not path, it's not 100% pathognomonic for uh, pneumothorax, but some of these other features are helpful. So if you have lung pulse, um, it's not likely to be pneumothorax. Next slide, thanks. Uh, I just want to give you one example um, of a patient with COVID who, uh, who had an x-ray that does look a little abnormal at the left lung base, um, but this uh, x-ray does not tell the whole story. And I think I really agree with your uh, points before about how uh, POCUS has to be integrated with the physical exam and other imaging findings. And uh, if you look at the ultrasound slide next, uh, you'll see that uh, at the right apex, uh, there's a normal A-line pattern. That's normal aerated lung. Oh, sorry, if you could just go back one slide. That's normal aerated lung at the left uh, apex. At 
Sorry, if you, if you could play the video clip, the, the, uh, on the right apex, we have a normal aerated lung and um, we have uh, at the right lung base, um, a few bee lines. Um, the left apex has some bee lines that come across the screen as well, but more importantly at the left base, there's uh, pathologic findings. The, there's pleural effusion, there's also consolidated lung. And that really wasn't um, appreciated as much on uh, chest X-ray. So, you know, ultrasound is, is more sensitive, certainly for finding fluid, um, but, but some of these other uh, key uh, diagnoses. This is a case of someone with COVID who we treated with uh, for bacterial superinfection uh, based on the uh, consolidation and effusion um, and, and the time, of course, of, of, of their illness. Um, so next slide. I know that uh, this is... Uh, uh, commonplace, uh, depending on your practice, you know, to use ultrasound for um, the assistance of, in, in many procedures, but also central line placement. I just want to highlight a few key COVID-specific considerations. Um, one of them, uh, if you go next, is not just uh, looking for uh, the uh, right target vessel uh, in terms of ultrasound-guided central line placement, but actually making sure there isn't a thrombosis. And I will say, uh, the series I saw, 31% of patients uh, had uh, thromboses uh, in, in the ICU. You know, that's a higher rate than, than expected. That's with COVID uh, disease. And so making sure that, that uh, there was patency of the vessel uh, and not a clot that we're detecting line. Her line may have a thrombosis later on. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, uh, helpful when you're thinking about delays in confirming line placement. If you see your uh, guide wire in the target vessel before dilating, um, that's an added step that can um, be helpful to ensure venous placement of, of the guide wire. Uh, next slide. Uh, this one is, uh, I think, uh, really helpful. It, you know, this has been studied in several um, settings that a subclavian or IJ central line that is placed correctly, uh, if it's in the SVC, that uh, administration of a, of a 10 cc saline flush that's agitated um, will appear through the SVC into the right atrial, um, uh, right atrium, right ventricle, very uh, quickly, less than two seconds. And if it's delayed more than two seconds, uh, that uh, you see this, it suggests that the catheter is misplaced. And I think that's important for confirming line before, um, uh, especially if x-ray or other uh, ways of confirming line are delayed uh, in the setting of this pandemic. So uh, thanks for letting me pack in a lot uh, and I uh, turn it over to the next uh, folks. Thanks, Dr. Galen. Next, I also want to give Dr. Taman the opportunity to present highlights of the POCUS Twitter Journal Club that occurred on April 21st, 2020. This journal club focused on our statement and it was a wonderful way to get the global community of users involved. As you can see, the journal club was a hit on social media with over 5 million impressions. This was a great way for us to hear directly from users how they're using cardiopulmonary POCUS and bring other resources to our attention. So I would recommend that you can also follow along on these tweets. Um, they are archived under the hashtag, hashtag ASC Echo Journal Club. Next, I'm gonna get Dr. Taman to uh, explore the rich world of these tweets and uh, explain how they informed our picture of how point of care ultrasound is being used globally. Dr. Taman, we'd like you to take it away, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Jory. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And I wanted to start by with this uh, series of tweets which delineates something from our statement pertaining to why do we do POCUS in these COVID-19 infections? And this graph, this chart is directly from our statement. And I was happy to see that Dr. Kalagara used our uh, tweets in informing um, and sharing this information with his colleagues. And there's the whole 
point behind our education uh, in, in terms of our statement. We want this to be shared and um, amplified. This is a very important part of our mission. And next slide. Some of the highlights included starting off questions with lung pocus. And as Dr. Galen uh, wrote in his tweets, we're, besides looking for the artifacts, which are what we are looking for, um, POCUS, pulmonary POCUS is very helpful also in diagnosing and differentiating between lung consolidation and pleural effusion. And I will go into what is normal, A lines and B lines, just reiterating what Dr. Galen has already uh, said in this webinar, but repetition is learning. And that is one of the fundamental things that we do with our journal club. Next slide, please. One of the many questions that had arise uh, include, how many lung zones do we scan in our protocol? And Tom Jellick joined in our Twitter club and produced this beautiful slide that I'm sharing, uh, photographing the different regions. And you can see there's two in front, one and two, um, number three and four are laterally on the side, and then five and six on the back, posterior. And we're finding in COVID that we're finding pathology mostly in the inferior and posterior portions. And that is in distinction to what we see in heart failure patients, which is more anterior and superior um, in regions one and two in this photograph. Next slide, please. A-lines. One quick way of thinking about them is A is for aeration. And a simple um, thing to think about is the bat sign, which of course we can remember in COVID because we believe that it originated in a bat. And um, these A lines actually, the wings of the bat are formed by the rib shadows and the body is just a refraction artifact. And we see it as these repeating horizontal A lines throughout an image. And above, you may also see uh, lung sliding. It can help when you have an obese patient, but also these A lines can be present, as you can see in this GIF um, that Dr. Hatim uh, Solomon shared, that A lines can be present in, in a pneumothorax where B lines and lung sliding have disappeared. Next slide, please. Also, B lines are just these hyperechoic artifacts and they arise from the pleural lines. And the important thing to note here is that you can have one to two B lines, they're normal, but when you start getting above three, that's when you start to suspect that there may be an abnormality because it correlates with extravascular water. And you can see these diffuse um, B lines. Um, correlating with that. Next slide, please. This is a beautiful slide shared uh, on Twitter by Dr. Um, Hatim Solomon. And it just shows the correlation of uh, loss of aeration that you can see um, compared to a CAT scan. The ultrasound in early COVID shows just scattered B lines that uh, constitute mild disease, but then become more confluent when you get into intermediate disease or moderate disease, as you can see correlating with the CT. And when you get to severe COVID, you can see consolidation. Next slide, please. Another highlighted point was a differential of this pleural sliding, as you can see in this GIF. There could be a pleural fibrosis, you could have no ventilation or right main stem intubation and cardiac arrest. Next slide, please. Another point uh, to make is how do we do prone imaging? This is something new for all of us taking care of these COVID patients. And we th put the left uh, shoulder up, elevate it with a pillow into a swimmer's position, as you can see in the diagrams and also real live presentation. Uh, this is a way to get the probe in the right uh, place to get the information that you need for apical images. 
Next slide, please. How often should we use color Doppler and POCUS? This question came up and we recommend using it every time. And as Dr. Jory wrote in this tweet, thinking a bit more of a, a binary assessment rather than a quantification. Um, as you get more comfortable and more familiar, you may be able to quantitate a little more, but even that can be difficult. But certainly we can note the presence or absence of um, regurgitation uh, or, um, or not. Next slide, please. Dr. Calagro also asked, are handheld devices more advocated than just a regular TTE machine? And handhelds are great because it's very easy to clean them afterwards. And sometimes you can lessen your sonographer's exposure because you all can do the, the scanning yourself once you're in the room and you can save PPE. But you have to know the person, ha the person has to know how to do a good POCUS scan for it to be um, valuable in that respect. Um, but whatever instrument you have, if you have um, an echo machine, a regular TTE machine, use that. Um, some places are actually having dedicated ones in COVID units, but it really depends on the level of disease uh, burden that your hospital is seeing. Next slide, please. We use POCUS really mo to minimize exposure, both in terms of time and in terms of the the dose because if we can do the POCUS when you're already in the exam room with the COVID positive patient, for example, putting in an A-line or uh, putting in a central line, or even when you're doing an intubation, you can get it all done wearing the same PPE. Another point that was made that, you know, you can use these disposable gel packs or you can actually put gel in a syringe um, to save you time again. Next slide, please. Another point of safety came up with using PPE when you're using uh, POCUS. And most of us agree and advocate along with AAC using proper protection, using an N95 and a face shield or a PAPR and using the same precautions with sonographers or who, whoever's performing the scan. And in fact, you can cover the POCUS machine, which was nicely demonstrated here in this photo, um, if you have a plastic. Next paragraph. I mean, next slide, please. Another great point that was brought up was that when you disinfect, know that there is a variable time, uh, wet time for each disinfectant. Each one has a different um, one. And that sometimes we don't remember. Um, and another thing that was shared by Garvin Kane from Mayo was that you can use, again, whatever repurpose cath lab supplies if you have extra plastic, again, to protect yourself, to protect your machine. Next slide, please. Also in our document, we note that you can make a two-point assessment for DVT. And um, this was highlighted because of the, it, prevalence in uh, COVID patients of um, DVTs and um, venous thrombi. And this can reduce your exposure because you can come in with one, one person and do the scan if you know how to do it. And this is becoming even more particular as we are learning more about COVID disease and realizing how much of it is related to microthrombi burden. Next slide, please. One of question that comes up often is how do we use this um, in POCUS patients, uh, patients who come in with ACS is that sometimes you have ST changes on your EKG, but it looks like an ACS, but it really isn't. And POCUS can help you because if you have a myocarditis, as you can see, you may have thickening of the left ventricular wall. You may have just, you can either have regional or global um, dysfunction, although if you have regional, we find it more in the lateral inferior um, uh, walls. Next slide, please. 
One other point is that we use ultrasound enhancing agents, uh, short for UEA, um, especially when we're doing a limited uh, transthoracic echo in order to help distinguish if we have an ACE, uh, acute coronary syndrome or we're having a Takotsubo's. And the best method is if you see a presence of a perfusion, um, apical abnormality, and that represents microvascular dysfunction and it's readily seen when you use uh, ultrasound enhancing agents. And in fact, some of our sonographers, uh, Kelly Kayser uh, tweeted that we're bringing in these um, ultrasound enhancing agents into the room just because we want not only in these situations to distinguish between an ACS or a Takasubos, but sometimes the imaging is very difficult to see um, the borders. And this really improves evaluation of LV function and then also may prevent somebody else from having to do another study. Um, at this time, you, you have to use a TEE machine, um, an, a, an echo machine, um, as uh, POCUS uh, machines don't support this at the current time. Next slide, please. We use POCUS, especially in light of uh, the tr elevated troponins, and we see troponins elevated in up to a quarter of the patients coming in, and this portends the most um, highest risk for mortality uh, even when you look at other factors like LDH, other blood tests, D-dimers, and lymphocytes, um, a meta-analysis on troponin levels had a very strong correlation. So we like to distinguish uh, in those examples where the troponin is severely elevated um, between what looks like a, using POCUS to distinguish what looks like a normal LV and um, may just be part of a cytokine storm to what uh, troponin is related to maybe an ACS or a Takotsubo's or a myocarditis. It is very critical in our uh, decision making. Next slide, please. And lastly, we also see this McConnell sign, which is um, lateral free wall um, hypokinesis, relative sparing of the apical um, RV segment. And this tells us that we have RV pressure overload, sometimes seen when we have PEs, and this is coming up quite often in uh, these COVID patients. Um, and uh, we wanted to um, just reiterate that point because this is something that we're seeing more and more of on the floors and in the ICUs and tells us that the RV dysfunction is probably acute. Uh, next slide. Thank you very much, Dr. Taman. That was wonderful. So today we learned about the importance of the cardiopulmonary POCUS protocol from Dr. Mulvey. And the important point that she brought up was her ask from cardiologists to move outside of their conventional box and also consider learning and doing more lung ultrasound. From Dr. Gillen today, we learned about the specifics of lung ultrasound in patients with COVID-19 infection or, or being assessed uh, with symptoms of viral pneumonia. And finally, from Dr. Taman, we had this opportunity to gather information, questions, and other learning resources from our global community of users, in a sense, crowdsourcing our knowledge and our information during this pandemic. Thank you to all of my panelists. Next, we are going to move on to our questions from our audience. Thank you. Uh, one of the most popular questions was uh, to Dr. Taman, what are UEAs? Ultrasound enhancing agents. Right, contrast agents. I love agents. that word. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah. Now, in fairness, um, at the current time, there aren't any of the smaller handheld devices that I'm aware of that have any contrast specific um, imaging uh, algorithms or schema in them. So um, that generally is going to be for your laptop size or full size machine where you're going to be using uh, ultrasound enhancing agents. Um, and that uh, can be very useful, uh, particularly in patients that have uh, very poor images, as many do when they're supine and with pneumonias. Um, and moreover, um, I would like every to refer everyone as well to an excellent webinar that was just held yesterday too, that was also by the ASE, specifically looking at the use of UEAs in COVID patients um, so that um, we can extend the use. And as you mentioned in one of those tweets, the one um, that Dr. O so so kindly amplified about uh, being able to uh, have some inference on differentiating uh, stress cardiomyopathy from actual occlusive coronary artery disease based on whether or not, uh, first of all, the, the pattern of the regional wall motion abnormalities, but also uh, whether or not there is perfusion within the myocardium. Uh, similarly for myocarditis, if you have global hypokinesis and you have presence of contrast echo within the myocardium, this would be more consistent uh, with a myocarditis type of situation. However, if you had a focal regional wall motion abnormality, particularly enhanced by the information that there is no perfusion there with um, contrast, then that would be co uh, consistent with occlusive coronary disease. And then if you saw a stress cardiomyopathy, you would expect to see some perfusion in the area of wall motion abnormality. Uh, wouldn't be absent, but it might be less than um, the adjacent territories. So the combination of both the information that we can get from uh, enhancing the left ventricular um, uh, pacification and enhancing the endocardial definition for regional wall motion assessment plus the information uh, within the myocardium uh, on the perfusion can be very useful in trying to understand uh, the patient that is presenting with a reduced cardiac function, particularly the COVID patient that you have some perhaps um, a reluctance to take them uh, to the uh, cath lab and expose many more people. Uh, and we are finding that indeed the troponin elevations are less frequently associated with occlusive coronary disease, but this must still obviously be in the differential diagnosis. Could you have any further comments on that, Ritu? I know, I think that's great, but another question that just popped up is, um, if microvascular uh, dysfunction causes perfusion uh, defects on echo contrast in COVID-19, aside from lack of regionality, that runs along coronary territory, how do you differentiate this from epicardial disease? Uh, you know, I, I could try to tackle that a little bit. <laughs> it is, it's not absent perfusion. That's the point. There is still, we've seen, and we have published on this previously about in stress cardiomyopathies, um, there is reduced perfusion often, um, although sometimes it's, it depends on the time, the temporal frame. If it's a little bit later than the acute insult, it might actually be enhanced perfusion. So, but there is some perfusion usually uh, that has been documented uh, in the studies that have looked at stress cardiomyopathy, as opposed to if it's occlusive uh, disease because of a coronary thrombus, uh, then it would be absent perfusion. So um, just to clarify the question, it isn't that it's absent uh, microvascular um, circulation perfusion. Uh, it, it, with the patient that has a stress cardiomyopathy, it could be reduced, but it's still present. So that is the differentiating feature. And we have a question from Dr. Kalagra. I'm happy to see him here again. He was on our um, uh, journal club. The question is, is there any role for venous excess ultrasound scanning in COVID-19 uh, uh, focus protocols? That one sounds like for you, Amr. Um, yeah, so that's actually been um, going around Twitter, this uh, VEXA scan protocol, uh, where they look at the grades, grade one, two, and three interpretation based on the uh, IVC. And there's, there's quite a few handy um, tutorials available on the website, and there's a couple of papers that uh, have been validated. Um, so I would call this to, I would say that this is a, a more advanced form of point of care ultrasound. So we haven't really uh, delved into that in our current statement um, because um, we recognize that this is something that 
uh, would be used by more of the advanced users, um, especially, for example, in, in critical care, uh, because it's involving looking at the IVC, measuring the IVC, uh, as well as looking at the uh, portal vein Dopplers, renal vein Doppler, um, and hepatic vein Doppler form. Um, and, and so uh, it, it can be a little bit tricky to do. Um, but if you're familiar with it, I think it has um, some uh, assessment value uh, in, in your fluid status assessment uh, in, in these ill patients. Uh, Dr. Galen, have you had um, experience with this protocol yourself or your colleagues? No, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I was, uh, I'm interested to learn more though. Thank you. One of the things that uh, we have been interested in looking at a little bit more is also looking at vascular ultrasound with respect to patients who have been have a suspicion of uh, DVT. Um, and so there has been some uh, publication and some reports on the two point compression test, which is sort of a quick uh, bedside assessment of point of care ultrasound assessment uh, for, for DVT. And uh, again, um, we've, in, in the statement, we've uh, framed this as plus or minus part of your protocol because again, we recognize not everyone has uh, experience with this protocol, uh, but there are some users that are looking at uh, the two and the three point compression vascular uh, exam. Uh, I would say that some of the stuff, uh, you know, can be done more quickly by an experienced sonographer. So it's about balancing uh, your, your resources and how quickly you need that information. So that does bring us to uh, the end of our seminar. I'd like to thank our speakers again, Dr. Mulvey, Dr. Gillen, and Dr. Taman. Uh, and uh, it's been wonderful to uh, be part of this uh, ASC uh, webinar series. Please st keep in mind that we'll be doing more uh, ASC webinars, and we look forward to answering more of your questions and providing more education in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good thank day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.